Well, I don't know where you were, but where we came from, there was quite a storm. Matter of fact, it was so bad I called the preacher and told him I didn't think I'd get here tonight. I wasn't even sure I'd get out of my driveway. Uh, couldn't get the garage door open because electricity was off. And uh, we figured out a way to do it, though. And we praise the Lord for that. Turn your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we're going to read the same verses that we read uh, when I preached the last time. This is the second point to the message, really. I hope I, the Lord will resurrect it and let it speak to our hearts. If you'll stand, please, we'll read from chapter 4 of the book of Acts. This is actually called the first persecution by a lot of folk. And it gives us an idea of what the church went through in those early days. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now evening tide. Albeit many of them which heard uh, the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and, Ca and Caphaeus, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you, uh, unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you, uh, builders, which has become the head of the, uh, of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now let's bow for prayer. Our Father, as we come to you tonight, we realize that in ourselves we have nothing to say. I thank you that we've read the Word of God. And even if we didn't have a message, we've had a word from you. And your word will never pass away. And I thank you for this knowledge. And I pray tonight that you be pleased to bless your people. If some have paid a price to get here. I pray that your blessings would be upon them. And now, Father, I pray you'd bind the devil and give liberty to me, your servant, that I might preach the word of God with authority and with power. Speak through me, Lord, and I'll not steal your glory. I'll not take credit for anything you do but I'll honor Jesus in whose name I pray and ask these blessings. Amen. Amen. And I think by now everybody knows there's been an election in America. And the moral majority spoke up. But the moral majority is not what we need. It's the silent majority. Christians, I'm saying to you tonight, that we need to speak up for the Lord. We need to allow him to use us as vessels to glorify his name. You know, we need an epidemic of boldness. Boldness that takes us beyond the realm of just understanding. You might have seen or read with me in verse 13, it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, 
if you're one who wants to testify for the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're a little timid, you're a little fearful to speak up for the Lord, then I want your attention tonight. Because I have been there. I remember when I first started pastoring way back in the mid-60s, I was fearful to witness. I knew I was supposed to, and I wanted to be faithful. Uh, but, you know, uh, when I'd go out to witness or knock on doors, I did it with fear and trembling. Matter of fact, there were some days I literally hoped that nobody was home. <laughs> and when I knocked on the door, I was concerned about who was going to come and answer the door and how they would treat me. I was very fearful. Matter of fact, I've always been somewhat of a recluse. You wouldn't believe that now because I've overcome that fear pretty well. But as a young man, I was very reluctant to mix. I was very reluctant to speak. Now in the ministry, it was expected of the pastor to witness and to deliver the word of God. Now I knew God had called me to preach. My wife made sure of that. I remember one, and this is a funny story that has nothing to do with my message, but I want to share it with you. I told the preacher about it the other day. Uh, I was preaching at a church in Atlanta, Georgia, and I made mention that my wife spoke to me one day, and she said, Daddy, and she did call me Daddy, even though we didn't have any children, she said, are you sure God called you to preach? I said, well, sure, I'm sure. Why, why would you say that? She says, well, you spend six or eight hours on your midweek service. You spend another six or eight hours on the sermons on Sunday. She said, there's just not enough hours in the week for you to be called to preach. Well, I, I knew I was called to preach. I was pretty sure of that. And this particular night, I shared it as an illustration just for whatever reason. I don't remember that. But I do remember that at the close of the service, Brother Moore, the pastor of Peachtree Baptist Church, where we were, said, church, I'd like to call the church into business meeting, and uh, I would like the church to give Mrs. Marsh $100 for making sure her husband was called to preach. <laughs> uh, and do uh, you remember that, Hazel? <laughs> uh, but, but it was a wonderful experience uh, just to see how God uh, was working. Now, loyalty, on the one hand, would give me the desire to witness. But little faith within my soul made it very difficult. I did not have boldness. I did ha have the assurance that God would use me to share the gospel. Well, what was it that made Peter and John so bold? Yeah. It's not a secret but it has escaped the average Christian of today. I want us to go back and get the setting. Look at uh, the first verses that we read. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came up upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day. You know what that means? That means that they were thrown into the prison. They lost their liberty. They lost their freedom. They were put in the prison. They were in jail. Notice, for it was now evening tide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Now, here's my first point. If you're going to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, and you do it in the power of the Spirit, then you can expect persecution. They hated Jesus. You represent Jesus. And consequently, they're going to turn on you. That's the way the devil works. He does not want God's people to be vibrant or speak up for the Lord. And he's going to do everything in his power to shorten our witness. You can expect it. Now, the servant is no greater than the master. And Jesus paid a price. And they persecuted him. And you can expect them to persecute you and me. 
Really, this persecution that came upon Peter and John was not upon them because of who they were, but because who Jesus is. And we need to understand that the book of Acts, where we're reading from, is not a record of the apostles' workings. Rather, it is a record of Jesus Christ working through the apostles and disciples of the early church. Now, one reason why you and I don't make a greater impact upon our community and friends and even our loved ones is because so often we're fearful and then when we do get enough courage to speak to somebody, we usually blow it. <laughs> I hate to say that, but you know, in chapter 3, we have the setting for everything that takes place in chapter 4. There's a man that was brought to the gate of the temple. They called the temple beautiful. And he was laid there, and he's begging alms. And he's praying, and I'm sure he's asking for alms. And Peter looks at him and says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as we have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What a miraculous thing. What was done to this man was miraculous. It was supernatural. It was dramatic. It was, it was radical. I mean, here's a man who was brought every day to the gate of the temple. And suddenly, he's up. And he's walking. Now, people wanted to know what happened. How did he get healed? Where did this power come from? <coughs> Going back to our... <coughs> To chapter 3 and verse 12, we read, And when Peter saw it, he answered on the people and said, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye earnestly on us as though we, by our own power or holiness, we made this man whole? Peter is saying, Don't give us the credit. We don't want to steal God's glory. God did this, and he gives honor to the Lord. He says in our chapter 4, in verse 10, Be it known unto you and unto all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, now watch, whom God had raised from the dead, even by him, this man stands here before you whole. It was Jesus Christ who healed this man. Now, if Jesus Christ healed the man, it meant that he had to be alive. Preacher said this morning that dead people don't have any way of, you know, doing anything. And that's true. The resurrection of Jesus Christ went away and went contrary to the doctrine of the Sanhedrins. Uh, I'm sorry, not the Sanhedrins. The Sadducees, that's better. Uh, but anyway... Now, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And their petty doctrine stood between them and knowledge. They would rather hold on to false doctrine than examine the truth. Uh, so they opposed the truth. Now, they were the priests. They were the ones who swayed the multitudes in the temple. And yet, we read that Many of the people were leaving and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Matter of fact, we read that there were 5,000 men who were saved. And in that day, they had big families. Now the Bible says 5,000 men and women and children. It's been estimated, because they did have large families, that there may have been up to 20,000 people saved on this particular day. We'll never know this side of heaven. But I'll guarantee you 5,000 men didn't get saved by themselves or their wives and their children that would follow. And that's why it's so important for men to take the leadership and men to point the way and lead coming to the Lord. Now I want you to understand this. If you be in Christ and Christ be in you, and you feel the urge to really witness, you can expect persecution. It will come. Uh, in this world, the Bible says, we're going to have persecution. And the Bible goes on to say in another passage, rejoice 
and be exceedingly glad. You remember the story of Saul when he was on the road to Damascus and he was looking for the saints. He was going to kill them and destroy them and do his best to stop the early church. And of course, he was struck down with blindness and there's a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, the truth of the matter is, this is after Jesus Christ was crucified. This is after he was resurrected from the dead. And Jesus says, why persecutest thou me? Again, you cannot persecute a dead man. You can only persecute a live man. If you know the Lord Jesus, and if you stand up for the Lord, you will suffer persecution. An army sergeant one time said, if you stand near the general, you can expect the hottest artillery. So on the one hand, you're going to have persecution. But on the other hand, you're, there's going to be a persuasion. Now let me say something about persuading people. I can't persuade anybody. Neither can you. But if we were to reread verses 4 to 12, which we will not to save time, but we do know that when the church comes under persecution, the church becomes powerful. Persecution is not the worst thing that can happen. Matter of fact, it seems like Christians always strive better under persecution than they do in good times. But anyway, I said there were 5,000 men plus women and children who were saved. Who brought that conviction? What was it that caused them to turn to the Lord? You say, well, Peter preached a good message. Well, he did preach a good message, very biblical message. But I'll tell you what, there's no one that could preach in such a way to persuade that many people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ like they did. I'll tell you what it was. And this is also the source of their boldness. And that is the fact about a dead Christ that rose to live again. If it was just a dead Christ, nobody would have come to Jesus Christ. But because it was the resurrected Christ who was alive and in influencing the boldness of Peter and John, they couldn't get away from it. Some of those men would have been in Jerusalem at the time of the death and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they knew Christ as being dead, but now they're introduced to Jesus Christ as being alive. You know, you don't, you don't argue people into the kingdom of heaven. You just can't do it. I've tried that. When I was young, I'd win many a battle, but I'd lose the soul. So you don't do that. Uh, when it becomes an argument, if you're witness to somebody, when it becomes an argument, stop. We're not Jehovah Witnesses. We don't stick our foot in the door trying to persuade somebody to listen to us. If they don't want to hear, that's, that's up to them. But don't argue. You can argue, win the argument, but lose the soul. I'm not that concerned. Matter of fact, <laughs> kind of laughed at preacher. Well, I shouldn't say I laughed at him. I laughed with him. Uh, we were witnessing knocking on doors uh, this past week, and we knocked on one door, and this fellow said, no, nope, don't want it. And uh, I was waiting for Brother Paul's response because it was his door, and he said, okay, thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> and we left. Now, what would have happened if we argued with him? We just got him angry. And, and if I can leave a track with somebody, even though they may not accept my word, I feel like it's a good visit. When it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, people believe it because of an inner faith, something that happened. You remember Doubting Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas because he missed that Sunday night service. And uh, Jesus visited the church that night. And uh, boy, his 10 disciple friends were so excited about it. They said, Thomas, you don't know what you missed. You should have been in church. God visited us. Jesus came and in our midst. And Thomas says, yeah, I'm not interested. You guys are hallucinating. <laughs> now, that's not scripture, but that's about what happened. <laughs> uh, he said, I'm not going to 
believe it unless I see the prince in his hand and the wound in his side. Well, later on, Jesus comes again. And this time, Thomas is there. And Thomas sees the Lord. And of course, he's invited. Thomas, come. Jesus, come on. You, you put your fingers in my hand. Look. You know what he says? My Lord and my God. And he fell to his knees and worship. And that's what we need. Sometimes I believe as Christians, we need a new experience of the resurrection in our own lives. Something that we don't always have. Would you agree? But when the Holy Spirit of God filled these apostles, and now Jesus who is alive is directing them they speak with authority. Now they're marveled that they were unlearned men. But they spoke with authority. And it made an impact. They're not just simply arguing about a dead Christ. But they were expressing their belief in the risen Savior. Be it known. If you want to know how this man was healed. Be it known unto you by the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we need in our churches today. Amen. They were demonstrating what Jesus was doing in their own hearts uh, by what they I, You know, I would pray that when Brother Paul or I stand up here to preach, you wouldn't say, uh, there's Brother Marsh up there preaching. I mean, obviously, I'm here and you're looking at me, so you know I'm here preaching. But don't you think it would be so much better if you would say, Jesus is in Brother Paul and in this service. Jesus is in Brother Marsh as he preaches and he's in this service. That's who we need to see. He's the one that gets the emphasis. And if we can come to the place where that we put Jesus Christ first above everything, then we're going to have success like we've never known it. Now, now just remember this. I can preach but only God can impart the message. We can give you truth, but God has got to take that truth and apply it to our hearts. God does that. In verse 11, we read, This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders who has become the head of the corner. Now there's power in Christ to convict. Now remember, this, this is the high court. This, these are the people who are leading the Jewish religion. I mean, all, all of the religious leaders, the top gun of their movements, was there criticizing Peter and John for what has happened. And now Peter, and this is the same Peter, who just a few days before was a coward, petrified. He, he trembled at the voice of a little girl who said, you're one of them. He cursed and denied the Lord. And now, Peter is standing up in front of all the people and he's declaring Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Amen. Even though he's surrounded by these same folk that he trembled at before, now he's powerful. And now he's bold. In a way, he becomes a prosecuting attorney. <laughs> you know, you ever get fried? Do you ever get weary? Do you ever get frightened? Like the sergeant said in the army one time, he said, Men, the enemy's all around us. Don't let one of them escape. <laughs> that was Peter's attitude. He, he, he's, he's concerned about delivering the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, I mentioned that this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. There's, there's an ancient uh, theory. It's, it's a Jewish belief. That when they were building the temple of Solomon, they, they quarried all the building blocks away and they would bring them to the temple site and they constructed the temple without the sound of hammers and all the construction equipment. And, and, and they'd come and they'd get a block and bring it over, get another block. But there was one block right here in the center. It just seemed like every time that they tried to get around it. It got in the way. And so finally they said, that's a useless one. We don't even know where to put that. And so they uh, said, let's get rid of it. And so they, I guess they crowbarred. Anyway, they 
tumbled it over, and down into the valley of Kedron it went. Pretty soon the weeds grew over it. Nobody even knew where it was. Now they're coming to the end of building the temple. And they said, send us up the, the cornerstone. And they said, we've already sent it to you. No, you haven't. There's nothing here. Send it up. They looked around. No, we've already sent it to you. And then somebody remembered that the big block that they thought was useless was the cornerstone for the temple. Is that true? I don't know. It's a Jewish fable. It is a tradition among the Jews. And you know what? The Jews have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Yeah. And that's what Peter is reminding them of. And that's why this illustration is so good. And I, I, you know, if there is one message that the churches of Jesus Christ need today, it is that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. No one is going to go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Right. Now, if I cannot preach that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, then I'm not going to preach at all. The truth of the matter is, uh, if Jesus Christ is not the way to heaven, then there's no way he can be the way to heaven. In other words, it's all or none. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter almost follows up on this when he says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. So, you can expect persecution. You can expect persuasion. Uh, I, I don't have to depend upon my power or preacher's power to be a servant of the Lord. Uh, I had somebody tell me one time, you know, I've listened to you preach, Brother Mark. You'd make a good salesman. <laughs> but we're not salesmen. We're preachers. We're declaring the word of God. And, and I, I, I'm not going to try to persuade somebody in my power. I used to as a young man. But I'll tell you what, if I can talk you into something, somebody else can talk you out of it. But when that persuasion comes from the Spirit of Almighty God, oh, what a difference. And what power we need is the power of Christ. And we must recognize that. Now, you are... And I need to understand that if we have his presence, we're going to have a wonderful experience. You don't always have the results you want. Preacher and I, we've been, we, we, we have a good time. We knock on doors. We love to talk to people. Uh, talked to Katie one day, and she, she wanted to know what Bible we used, and you ask a few questions, and, you know, that, that was a divine appointment. And, and we have a wonderful time. But we don't, we don't try to persuade people. Well, I did say, Katie, you got to come along. <laughs> you just got to come along. <laughs> there was just something about it. We, we, there was that connection almost immediately. But, but the truth of the matter is, I can't, preacher can't persuade anybody. But God the Holy Spirit can. And when we talk about a resurrected Christ, that gets heaven excited. And that's what God wants from us. Now, these men, they couldn't shut them up. They couldn't hold them back. They refused to let up, shut up, or back up. They said, it's Jesus. And that's our message. That's right. And we need to remember that. Now, oh, what we got? A little over, let's say, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 people here tonight. Not a big crowd, is it? Not 14 people. But well, wait a minute. 16 people. I forgot the kids. <laughs> uh, but wait a minute. What would happen? If all 16 of us were filled with the Holy Ghost and had the boldness of God and went from one end of this community to the other sharing Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, it would make a difference. That's what God wants from you and me. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were bold because they had been with Jesus in the past, during that three and a half years of ministry, but also Jesus was with them today. Now, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of bring this to a close. But, but I want to tell you, the strategy of the devil is to stop us from speaking for the Lord. He doesn't want it. He hates it. And he'll do everything. And the real problem of the 21st century is that we lack the courage to speak up for the Lord. Now, 
We need a contagious epidemic of boldness. Now, holy boldness is different from human courage. A lot of men are courageous, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about something that is far different. You can have courage because you've taken a course of courage, like Dale Carnegie or something like that, but I'm not talking about that time of courage. I'm talking about a different type of courage. And maybe you say, well, Pastor, I'm just not wired that way. That's just not me. Remember Peter? Trembled, scared, petrified at a little girl, denied the Lord, cursed about the Lord rather than admit that he was one of his followers? What a difference when the Holy Spirit took over. I've had people say, well, I just speak my mind and I'm bold about telling them about Jesus. No, you're not. If that's your attitude, that's not what God wants. That's, that's, not, that's brassness. That's, 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 Jesus was tender. You never saw the Lord deal with people in any other way than in love and understanding. He wasn't arrogant. Persuasion? <laughs> they don't... You know I'm from the States. West Virginia, great place, mountainous place. But they have some strange ideas. In order to persuade people to come to church, they advertise, we're going to handle snakes tonight. And they go to church and they pull rattlesnakes. I saw a documentary on it on TV. They pull rattlesnakes out of the box. And they play with them. They may be bold, but they're not going to be bold very long. Right. Matter of fact, one of the fellows that was handling snakes on the TV program was bit by a snake a couple weeks later, and he died. I think I have a better way of persuading people to follow Jesus than handling snakes. <laughs> I, I, I gave that up before starting. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> persuasion comes from the Lord. Let's remember that. And, it, it, and you know, uh, boldness is, Lord Jesus, I'll do whatever you want me to do at whatever cost. If, if you want me to witness and it costs me, I'll do it. If I go to jail, I'll do it. Lord, I just want to be a witness for you. That's boldness. And that's the Bible boldness that I'm talking about. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, remember now, they had already been put in prison. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they'd been with Jesus. And now I want you to notice in this passage, which begins in verse 15, but when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they confirmed among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle has been done by them, as manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further uh, among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. But we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's the only hope for a sin-cursed world, to speak about Jesus and do it from the heart. And if you'll do it from the heart, God will bear witness to that. Remember, we're not to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. These early Christians were remarkable. They had no television, they had no radio, no advertisement, no buses to pick people up, no church buildings. But the Bible says they shook the world for Jesus Christ. I just want to tell you that the best and the most exciting experience you'll ever have is to introduce somebody to the Lord Jesus and see them saved. Now, I got good news and bad news in closing. If you do that, be ready for persecution. That's the bad news. The good news is, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Paul told that to Timothy. All right, preacher, God bless. Surprise ending.
<laughs> well, there's no song to close, but I do want to say this. I'll just turn this off. We were... Um,